Good evening, everyone. Great to have you here. It's great to see so many of you. Um, I know a lot of people have been talking about this and asking Pastor Daniel questions about his Israel trip. And I have, uh, of course, been able to, to be here week on week and, and hear some of these stories little by little. And, and uh, he's, he saved most of it, and I'm grateful for that because it'll be as much of a surprise for me as it will be for you. Um, I don't know if it's sunny and warm in Israel. Probably is a lot warmer than it is here right now. I wish we had a little bit of that warmth, but uh, I'm sure that due to just the fellowship that we have tonight, there is warmth in that. And I, before I invite Pastor Daniel up, I do want to just start in a word of prayer of thanks to God for what he does uh, throughout the ages, because uh, I think we'll be just amazed at what was going on thousands of years ago that even Pastor Daniel was able to witness some of the, the proof of, especially the, the things that are there that have been hidden, that have become revealed. And so we pray that, of course, ultimately, not just that the buildings and the roads that have been hidden would be revealed, but that the truth of Christ would be revealed in all of our hearts and minds and those that we interact with. So let's uh, come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks, Lord, when we hear of news that it seems that any archaeological dig in uh, the Holy Land just continues to point back to your word. And Father, we give you thanks that tonight uh, you have allowed uh, Pastor Daniel to have gone to Israel recently and to take some pictures to be able to speak of his uh, journey, Father, that you have uh, so generously provided. I thank you, Lord, that we get to benefit from that. I pray that it would open up our eyes, that ultimately we would continue to pray, Father, that uh, truth would be revealed in this lifetime, that many more would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Father, we pray this. Uh, we pray your hand of blessing upon tonight, and we give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Daniel, come on up. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Israel Night. Shalom. Habenu shalom aleichem. With words of peace, now I greet you. I would like to begin tonight with one of the most quoted scriptures that's found in the Bible by the Jewish people. It is a passage that Jewish children, it's one of the first things that they learn when they uh, begin to speak. And it doesn't matter if they're Hasidim, which means ultra-Orthodox, you've seen some of them here in Toronto, or the Orthodox, which might just have a yarmulke on their head. Uh, for the men, uh, Reformed Jews, Conservative Jews, it's interesting, Conservative Jews are not actually conservative, um, and even some Messianic Jews all quote the Shema, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. And they say it three times a day, their entire life, in the morning, in the evening, and before they go to sleep. I usually say it before I go to sleep, and I will read it um, now in Hebrew first, and then in English. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Vahafta at Adonai Elohecha Bechol Levavcha Obechol Navshacha Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And so that is uh, something that you could say, and everyone would, would uh, join in with you as you said that. When I was on the plane going to Israel, we had a a large number of Hasidic Jews with us from New York City, and uh, at a, it was a red-eye flight, and about two or three in the morning, I felt myself being jostled. And I opened my eyes and looked around, and there were all these men standing up, walking around in the plane. I thought, what are they doing? And what they have to do is they have to find ten men. So ten men have to come and pray together, 
and it's called a minion, and they all come together, and they went back into the galley. Some of the, the servers back in the galley weren't too happy about it, um, and they had to, because they had to pray together. And we saw that throughout the trip. It didn't matter if you're uh, Hasidim or whether you were Orthodox. It didn't matter. They would try to get another Jewish person to come and join them to, sit, to pray together. I wanted to share a little bit of background with you before I talk about my trip. Because this actually will give some context um, as to my trip. I'm the son of a Jewish Holocaust survivor, and I am the grandson of, a vict- of the victim of a Holocaust, or the, uh, a victim of the Holocaust. My grandmother um, sacrificed to get my father out to safety on the kinder transport. Some of you know this, that uh, the rescue of, of a Almost, not quite, 10,000 children out of Nazi-occupied Europe. Just over half of 1% of children were rescued uh, as compared to the 1.5 million that were slaughtered, Um, including every one of my father's peers who lived in the children's home where he lived. My grandmother was... Uh, very poor, and she had to work for a diamond merchant as a nanny, and so he was sent to a Jewish children's home, and he was rescued from there right after the Kristallnacht, and he ended up being the only one who escaped. All the rest of the children were loaded up on cattle trucks and slaughtered on the way to the concentration camp. Um, So, my dad was the poster child. You see the pictures up there. Poster child for the Jewish refugees in England, um, here are some famous pictures that have been published of my father. He's the one in the middle there, in that middle picture. And then that picture was also made into posters, which were plastered all over the UK. Um, I've seen film footage of my father's rescue in two documentaries. One is called Into the Arms of Strangers, Stories of the Kinder Transport, which won an Oscar back in the year 2000. There's film footage of my father uh, being rescued in that, um, that documentary, along with another one that was produced... 10 years earlier. This is the only photograph that I have of my grandmother, Celie Winter, and she sent it to my father just before she went into hiding. She was discovered by the Nazis and sent to Auschwitz where she was brutalized and she was starved before ultimately she was gassed just before the death camp was liberated. My father's uh, brother... Uh, Avner Winter had fled already to British Palestine, now called Israel, and in the 1930s went there as a teenager and uh, helped clear the malaria swamps that were there as a, as a teenager. It was pretty well a wasteland back in those days. He ended up fighting for Israel's independence with the IDF, Interna- or the Israeli Defense Forces, and then went on to raise a family with his wife, Hannah, uh, just outside of Tel Aviv in a little village called Ramat Hashavim which was a cooperative village that produced eggs for Tel Aviv. And uh, he survived the Holocaust. He survived all of the wars uh, in Israel, and he lived to the age of 70. And sadly, and somewhat ironically, he died when Saddam Hussein hit his village with Scud missile attack in January 1991. Great sorrow for our entire family. He died actually from a massive heart attack during the strike, but that he was considered a casualty uh, during that time. And so I wasn't able to get any pictures of him up, up there tonight, but I do, uh, we do have pictures in the family. 33 years ago, when I was in Bible college, I decided that I was going to make a trek to Israel and visit my uncle and aunt and take a course in Jerusalem. And so I saved up all my piano teaching money to go so I could visit them uh, and then take a course that would be counted as a credit for my, my classes at school. And the trip never happened. I was the only student in the school that signed up for it. And so it was canceled. And they had visited me when I was younger, but I never got a chance to go visit my uncle and aunt in Israel. They di- my uncle died very shortly after that. Then I had been invited by Bishop Robert Stearns. He is the uh, senior pastor of the Tabernacle in Buffalo, uh, New York. And then that trip was canceled because of COVID. This time, I had three weeks' notice. They contacted me three weeks before the trip, and they said, you're going. 
or are you going, actually? And, uh, and so uh, they told me it was, the trip was back on, and so I was invited by Eagle's Wings. It was paid for uh, by Eagle's Wings. Most of it was. And it was hosted by Bishop Robert Stearns, who is well-loved um, in Israel by Christians and uh, Palestinian Christians and Jews alike. He is well-loved there, a wonderful man of God. And as we approached Israel, and here's a picture, I looked out the window and I was surprised to see green. You can't really see it in that picture, but I could see green everywhere. It was like emerald, a rainbow. Uh, if you look really close, you can see a rainbow welcoming us. And Israel was a giant sand dune. Or some, not Israel. Tel Aviv was a giant sand dune um, before it was inhabited. And now it looks so beautiful. Just green everywhere. It had been raining for two weeks before we got there. And uh, it was so beautiful. And over the intercom, I heard the words, welcome home. I was not prepared for what was going to happen to me when I heard those two words, welcome home. The, the, the tears just began to flow. And uh, that happened multiple times throughout this trip. One of the things that impacted me right away at the airport, I don't know what I was expecting. I went to Belfast when I was in 1980, when I was a child. And uh, don't ask me why my parents took me to Belfast in 1980. But anyway, um, I was expecting soldiers with automatic weapons everywhere. There were none. That was a big shock. In fact, I didn't see one gun until my last maybe three days in Israel. Uh, in the airport, we were swabbed and we were tested for COVID. Um, there were, this other thing that just surprised me, there was Muslims working alongside Orthodox and Hasidic Jews, all with their, their um, uh, medical garbs on and just swabbing us all, working together. And then the first night we got to our hotel and they told us we weren't allowed to actually gather to eat supper until uh, our clearance came back from our swabs. So we went across the street, and right across the street, that's, that's our hotel on the one side, like right across the street was a Mediterranean, and we went on the beach, and we all ate on the beach in the dark shawarma, which was amazing. It tasted like heavenly food. Um, but it was, it was, it was amazing uh, time, and fre very fresh shawarma. The next morning, our bus took us down to Joppa, which is not too far away, down the coast, and this is the place where Jonah fled, do you remember? Jonah fled uh, the opposite direction when God called him to go to Nineveh. And uh, the, the house, um, the town, it's, it's also the town of someone else in the New Testament. Do you remember? Someone say it. Simon the Tanner, um, where Peter was up on the roof and the sheet was lift, let down and, and Peter saw all these unclean animals and the Lord said, Arise, kill and eat. And it happened several times. And so we were standing there outside the, the house of Simon the Tanner, which, which I smile when I say that, because um, our guide explained to us, or actually our host explained to us, that in Israel there are three types of historical sites. There is a site C, like that one we were standing in front of, um, where it probably wasn't where Simon lived. Um, it, it, it says Simon the Tanner's house on it, but it, it's been in the same family for 700 years. But it's probably not, but it's somewhere around there. And so, and it looks like it could be something similar because it has the flat roof and everything. So that is a sight C. And, and we, that was the last sight C that we saw. Our host was not too interested in taking us to sites that were sight C sites. Uh, then there's site B sites where it's very possible that it happened there, the event in the Bible happened there. And then you have the site A sites, which is amazing to see those because there's tons of evidence that those are the ones where these things took place. And so we went mostly to A sites on our tour. The contrast between ancient Joppa, from where I took this picture, you can see the walls there, and Tel Aviv is remarkable. Here you see this ancient, ancient civilization, the city from Bible times, and then within sight, if you see it in the distance, is a very modern city, um, which is literally sprung up from the sand dunes uh, that were there this past century. Uh, here are the 77 families you can see that started Tel Aviv on the sand dunes. That's where Tel Aviv is now. 
um, on the sand dunes of the Mediterranean. And we, so we visited Tel Aviv, and I don't have time to take you all through everything we saw there, but we saw the place where the Declaration of Independence was signed by Golda Meir and their first female prime minister, and it was very um, underwhelming, to say the least, to see this building, because it is completely under destruction, uh, under, not destruction, construction. They're trying to restore it, but it's very little tiny, almost like a, a tiny house where, the, uh, where this Declaration of Independence was very different than what you'd see in the United States if you saw something like that, right? So it, it was, and, and I've seen pictures of the signing of that, and what you may not know is that uh, during that time that that was being signed, there were bombs exploding um, all around uh, that were coming in from Egypt. Uh, so there was Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon were all attacking this fledgling country uh, right when this was happening, and, uh, which is a story for another time. That afternoon, we went up to a place called Mount Carmel. Does anyone know the famous Old Testament story that happened at Mount Carmel? Thank you. Say it. Elijah and the prophets of Baal. That's right. And so here is a statue of Elijah, well, kind of a violent statue, of, of him raising his sword uh, over one of the prophets of Baal, right ab- around the spot where, where this happened on, on, Mark, on Mount Carmel. And then you see, you hear the story in the Bible, and I've read it since again, and um, you, I stood right, at the, right near there is the spot where he would have looked out towards the Mediterranean. I don't know who that was that got in the picture. But anyway, um, you see this, you can see the Mediterranean in the distance, and you can see where he would have seen that little cloud, the size of a man's hand. Remember that story? And, and then he knew rain was coming after praying for rain. And so it's a very exciting story in the Bible. I encourage you to read it, First Kings chapter 18. And very close to that spot, even higher up on Mount Carmel, in fact, this is the very summit of Mount Carmel, there is this beautiful evangelical church which is associated with Teen Challenge. Anyone heard of Teen Challenge? Um, and Pastor David Wilkerson. And we had uh, just amazing, beautiful time of worship and prayer in a place that's a refuge for drug addicts and alcoholics who have found Jesus. It's a very exciting place. And so that was a really neat experience to see this place that is right there at the summit of Mount Carmel. Can you think about it, right? Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal there, and now there's an evangelical church rescuing drug addicts and alcoholics. I thought it was pretty cool. And then we, from there we went to Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee where we set up for the next two nights on our tour of the Galilee region where Jesus spent most of his years in ministry. And it was dark when we arrived. It was, it was getting really dark, and so we didn't really see much. I didn't know how close we were to the Sea of Galilee, and we had a seminar that was led by a rabbi in the hotel who has since become a very dear friend. We've been communicating since I've come home. Rabbi Natan, um, he and his wife are from South Africa, and they made Aliyah to Israel a number of years ago are now well, very well known in the country. Anyone know what Aliyah means? Yes? To ascend. And it's, it's the, uh, that's right, your daughter's name is Alia. And so, uh, and so that's the term that they use, uh, not only to ascend up to Jerusalem, but also it's the term now that's, that's used by millions of Jews all over the world who have come back to Israel. They call it, they've made Alia. So we heard that many times when we were there in Israel. It means to ascend or to go up. Rabbi Natan um, is on a journey. He has a deep love for God. He has a deep love for the Jewish, the Hebrew scriptures. He has a deep love for his homeland of Israel. And uh, he is on a journey. We had the opportunity to share with him a little bit uh, while we were there. And I hope that friendship will continue. We also had the opportunity to celebrate Shabbat with him. Um, His wife and son on the Friday night, he's got more children at home. But um, it was amazing. And I know I've shared this with our men's group, but... All around us in the hotel, there were Jews of all different backgrounds in the big dining room there. And they were all doing the same thing on the evening of Shabbat. They were quoting scriptures together in song. 
And one thing that really brought tears to my eyes, I remember just seeing this and thinking, wow. Rabbi Natan did what every devout Jewish father did, does on Shabbat, and he took, his child, he took his child, who's the same age as my daughter, into his arms, held his head against his chest, and prayed a blessing over him. And they do that with each of their children. And then the children, as they're sitting together, having a meal together, Shabbat meal together, they quote from memory, all the children quote from memory to their mother, Proverbs 31. And then they close by saying in Hebrew to their mother, you are a Proverbs 31 woman. And uh, as I watched that, I thought, this is astounding to me. Then they spend the entire day together on Saturday, not working, but worshiping, no phones, no computers, no social media, no shopping, just time together as family. And I thought to myself, no wonder their family units are so strong. So that was really, that was really, that impacted me deeply. The next morning, I woke up very early. Of course, I was on Canadian time still, so I woke up at like four in the morning, feeling very well rested and uh, just in time to make coffee and go out onto the little deck there. And this is what I saw. Um, sea of Galilee from my patio, listening to birds chirping all around, and just imagining Jesus making breakfast on the beach, right, for his disciples, having fished and cooking the fish. And uh, it was such a really, it was a really sweet time reading my Bible out there that morning. And then that morning after breakfast, we went to the Mount of Beatitudes where we could look down at the Sea of Galilee. We had a little worship service there. And I could just picture Jesus up on this hillside teaching um, his disciples and all, all, all these people gathered to see him and uh, preaching the Sermon of the Mount from Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. And you know what? It wasn't at all the way I imagined it. It's funny how we have these pictures in our mind when we're growing up of what it would have looked like. But it's, it, that happened to me all the way through. It, it was different than I imagined. And it was a breathtaking view. It was a gorgeous day. And I could just see how Jesus could have pointed as he's speaking to the birds and to the flowers of the field and to the pathways as illustrations as he taught. They were all around him. Then we went right down to Capernaum. So we were up on the hill, and then we went all the way down to Capernaum, which is right on the shore of Galilee. And so uh, here is the synagogue. We stood in the synagogue. It was built about 300 A.D., and it was built on the foundation of the synagogue that was built by, as you know from Scripture, it was built by a centurion for the Jewish people, where Jesus actually stood in that synagogue. So we were standing there in that synagogue, which was built over top in 300 AD, built over the synagogue that was already there. And we were fascinated, and I don't know if you can see this on the right-hand side, those two pictures together. We were fascinated, uh, this was pointed out to us, that there was ancient evidence of children playing during Sabbath worship in the synagogue. So they had little game boards cut into the stone, game boards for kids. I thought, well, they had children right there among them during their, their Sabbath worship. Jesus did a lot of his ministry right in this town, uh, if you read the scriptures. Mark chapter 1 says that Jesus taught in that synagogue. He healed a man with an evil spirit right there, and, and he returned time and time again to this town of Capernaum. A highlight of this day was going out on a boat. Uh, and, and you saw, if those were your church that Sunday when I was away, saw me bringing a greeting from that boat and uh, out into the middle of the lake. I just have something to mention. Our team was made up of about 22 pastors, all pastors. Some of them were very, very gifted preachers, and some of them were very gifted worship leaders. So you can imagine what it was like. We had like three services a day, at least, where we would stop and one of the pastors would read the scripture of where we were and then preach a sermon on it. And uh, then we'd have a worship time with the most amazing worship leaders from all over the United States and the UK. And um, you can imagine what that would be like. It's pretty amazing. Then we, we reached to the center of Galilee. The man, the pilot of the boat, turned off his engine. It's just quiet, just completely 
peaceful and quiet, and that's where we had our service there, second service of the day, um, and we just sang our hearts out, and I looked out, and I could just imagine Jesus walking on the water. No, I didn't take a picture of him, but Jesus walking on the water towards us. I was just, it was just amazing experience, just to see everything around us. That same afternoon, that same day after lunch, we went to we had, went to St. Peter's Fish uh, restaurant for lunch. Of course, we had to tr- try St. Peter's Fish. And um, by the way, that lake is Sea of Galilee or Lake Knisseret. It is full. It is teeming of fish right now. And uh, actually, if someone, if anyone here has any doubt about that, talk to Bill Palmer. He was there one time at the Sea of Galilee, and he saw thousands, tens of thousands of fish all near the surface. And so uh, it, is, it is amazing. That same day we visited a beautiful Catholic renewal center um, that Pope John Paul visited, and it was built on the peak of the Mount of Beatitudes. So you can see there the Sea of Galilee. Just go back one slide again. Um, oh, you can still see it there? Good. Um, and it's just, it is amazing. It's an amazing place. It's right in the center of that whole library there. They have an ancient scroll of Torah. You'll see it there. And um, this place really made, was interesting to me because I don't know if you know the history of the Catholic Church, but there's, there's, they have struggled with anti-Semitism over the years. And this place, meeting this priest who was a friend of the former Pope uh, John Paul, um, it was interesting because this man loves the Jewish people. And so he teaches Catholics who come there, and a lot of them are studying to be priests, the meanings behind the Jewish feasts and their prayers, and he, he really shares with them their roots, their, their roots of uh, Judaism in Christianity. And so, so it's a really interesting place, and um, as you know, the Bible says, news spread over the whole region of Galilee about Jesus, Mark says. And so Jesus, the Bible says in Mark chapter 4, verse 23, visited all the synagogues around the Sea of Galilee, and that's where he met, in one of the towns, he met Mary Magdalene at Magdala. And so that's where we went next. Remember, do you remember the story in Luke chapter 8, verse 2? He cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. For me, the synagogue at Magdala was even more significant to me than the one in Capernaum. Because when they uncover the ruins, and there's not much there, I mean, there's, they had to put a canopy over it to stop it from getting rained on, but um, interestingly, this is, the, I said the, one was, the other one was built 300 AD, this one was actually around at the time of Jesus. Because when they uncovered, they, when they dug underneath, they found some coins with that time period on it. And so, you could see there mosaic tiles where you could just think Jesus would have walked on those tiles with the sandals. And um, so that was really, I don't know, that really was significant to me. Another synagogue in Magdala has just been uncovered uh, close by with multiple homes uh, from the time of Jesus. Something really, really amazing happened. In fact, this was happening to us wherever we went. We'd have these chance encounters with, with people that weren't chance encounters. We knew that the Lord was helping us. We arrived just in time to meet one of the world's top professors uh, in, the, in the region, Dr. R. Stephen Notley, who has in, been involved in these digs around Galilee, and R. Stephen Notley is Distinguished Professor of New Testament and Christian Origins in New York City campus of Nyack College. He's chair of the college's Biblical and Theological Studies Department. He has written a lot about his discoveries and, and the discoveries of the archaeologists there, and he just happened to be in Magdala when we arrived. He doesn't normally talk to tour groups like ours. But would you believe that our host, Bishop Stearns, was his kid's piano teacher many years ago? (laughs) And because of that unique connection, he actually spent time with us, and he gave us two lectures. I filmed them both. He actually was looking at me as I was filming them because he was saying, some of this is going to be released to the media on Monday, uh, and so please, you know, and so I didn't post anything that he he did, but I would like to show them sometime. Um, Amazing! Some of the things he's discovering right now will be in Bible commentaries in the future. That night, we dined outdoors at a restaurant in Tiberias where the former Israeli Prime Minister, Bibi, some of you know who that is, 
love to dine, Benjamin Netanyahu, and uh, this was a very interesting experience because they brought out pe fresh pitas and hummus. It was so delicious, and we filled up on that, and we didn't realize it was a six-course meal. <laughs> and so we almost, we were groaning by the time they brought the meat platter out. And so um, then our host, which you see right there in the middle, Bishop Stearns, he used to be a classical music singer. He sung at Carnegie Hall, and he sang the Hatikva, which means the hope, which is the Israeli national anthem, which was written 50 years before Israel was even established, the modern Israel was even established. And uh, my parents used to play on a record player when I was a little kid, uh, and his rendition was so powerful uh, that the entire restaurant stood up on their feet and did a standing ovation when he was done. They cheered for like so long after he sang. And then they said, well, you have to sing that at the Knesset. So um, he, he was, uh, he, it was very moving. And I encourage you to, to look that story of that song up. I have a recording on my computer of Holocaust victims who were six days after they were rescued from concentration camp singing it. And it's a very moving, moving and um, recording. The next morning, we left Tiberias. We drove to the very spot. I don't have a picture of it right now because we were on the bus, but where the Jordan River starts from the Sea of Galilee, beautiful spot. And our first stop was the Spring of Hered. And anyone know what happened here? I know Pastor John does. Anyone else know what happened here? Gideon, right, Gideon. So this is the mouth of the spring where uh, uh, Gideon was with his army. And you, you remember how God whittled down uh, the troops from 32,000 to 300 men? Do you remember how? What's that? Yeah, how they drank the water. That's right. When we got off the bus there, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, the the thick grass there was just soaking wet, and I was wearing these canvas shoes here, and I said to somebody, uh, did it rain recently? And they said, no, that's the dew. And all of a sudden, I remember the story of the dew, and Gideon, when Gideon put out this fleece, do you remember that? And he had to wring it out into a bowl. That's how thick the dew was when we were there. And uh, I drank from the spring, and you know what? It was cold and delicious, and you can read there why it is so, such good-tasting water because of the minerals that are in it. Um, and next, we went to the Jordan River, to the wilderness place where John the Baptist preached the message of repentance and baptized the Israelites. Also, the same place where the Israelites crossed into the Promised Land. It's the same spot there. Um, it's not the traditional the site that, that uh, some people have wanted to say it was the spot where uh, John the Baptist baptized. It's, it's f f what our tour guide believes is the, the real site. And, you know, God did something really amazing there. First of all, that place is like wilderness. It is so barren. There's not even one blade of grass, except when you get right up to the river. It is so barren. And you can just picture John the Baptist there preaching uh, repentance. And one of the pastors came up to me very quietly and he confessed to me that he'd never been baptized. And, uh, but now he said, now is the time. And Pastor or Bishop Robert Stearns baptized him. Joy the Lord just burst out of, the, out of this pastor. And um, then something even more startling happened was a man showed up, just showed up where we were. There was like, there was no tourists around, right? So this man showed up and he's from Ireland and he said he wasn't, he said, I wasn't even supposed to be here today, but something told me that I was supposed to come down here and talk to you. He didn't know we were pastors. <laughs> but uh, right there, the Lord spoke to this man. He repented of his sins, tears weeping. And um, the pastors rallied around him. Some of them got his contact information, and he was baptized on the spot. There he is out in the, in the muddy, overflowing banks of the Jordan River. Um, it's, it's, it was very... Um, high that time of year because of the rain they've just had, one of the pastors came with this beautiful white shirt. And as soon as he saw the water, he said, oh no, I just pictured it being clear. <laughs> he was like, okay, if you want to go in there. So another uh, a Russian uh, Jewish soldier 
uh, whose parents had made Aliyah from Russia when he was just a, a small baby, also came down and he had a big smile on his face. And I was wondering if he was a Christian, just the way he was reacting to the baptism. And uh, I spoke to him afterwards. His name is Ron, and there he is. And um, I was wondering if he was a Christian, as many Russian Jews, and I learned this, many Russian Jews who have come to live in Israel believe in Jesus as the Messiah. By the way, I'm just going to show this next picture. All teenagers have to serve uh, two years in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, when they turn 18. My cousins included, uh, Elan and Daniela. Uh, the girls now have a choice, actually, if they would like to serve in the IDF or they can serve in another type of medical field. They can volunteer in a medical field for two years. I was also surprised to see several Muslim IDF soldiers during the trip and when I came home, I looked it up on Google and said, why did, why did I see some Muslim uh, um, Israeli soldiers? And it's because they actually have whole divisions of their IDF that are Muslim. 20% of Israel is Muslim. And so uh, Muslims and those of the Druze religion, who we met some of them as well, serve in the, in the army and also the Knesset as well, the, the government. From there, we journeyed all the way down to the Dead Sea, we stopped for lunch at the Dead Sea. It's the only time I saw a camel. My kids asked me when I came home, did you see camels? One, it was for tourists. <laughs> People drive nice cars there, <laughs> just like here. And um, from there, we, we journeyed there. We passed the, the Qumran Caves. You know, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Um, we didn't go up into the caves, but we, we saw where they were. And Israel is a very interesting country. I, I was really... I, I knew this intellectually, but to see it's such a tiny, tiny country, and yet it's a microcosm of what you'd find in the whole world. You find a mountain with snow. You find a freshwater lake teeming with fish. The, uh, the Sea of Galilee is actually fed from salt water springs and, and uh, fresh springs. There is places with just lush, lush vegetation and lots of trees. I was, we were driving along the highway, and I saw orange trees just growing wild on the side of the road. I was thinking... Why aren't people picking those oranges? The Jordan River, right, that was swollen from the winter rains before we arrived. But then there's this area of the country that's desert, where nothing grows. And that's what it's like near the Dead Sea. It is the lowest place on earth, 420 meters below sea level. Nothing flows out of there. The, the, the sea is getting smaller and smaller because it evaporates. Now, they are thinking of actually joining it, filling it back up again with the sea next to it, the Red Sea. I don't know how they can do that, but anyway, but they're talking about that. But anyway, it is the lowest place on earth. You, we didn't get a chance to swim in. I thought Canadians should be able to swim in there because they said, oh, it's too cold. But they um, didn't know that I, I've swum up at Tobamori before. So um, it, was, it was just a beautiful spot. Even though it's so barren, it was beautiful. How many of you have heard of Masada? Some of you have. Have you, have you seen the movie Masada? If, if you haven't, uh, let me just tell you, it's one of the most per perfectly preserved sites in the, in the land. It is a fortress on top of a mountain overlooking the Dead Sea. Uh, King Herod, who is a brilliant builder but paranoid megalomaniac, built it as one of his hideouts, his, his getaway places in case of attack. Um, he fully stocked it full of food and water and even baths, which is amazing if you think about it because there's no food and no fresh water for a long, long ways away. And so slaves would have had to carry all this up the side of the mountain way up uh, just to stock it for him whenever he decided he was going to use it. So they would have had to continually keep it stocked even though he never, ever used it. There's no evidence that he ever used it. But... When the Romans besieged Jerusalem in 70 AD, almost a thousand Jews fled to Masada. And they lived there within the walls. They had enough, lots of food while the Romans camped below. And see that picture there? I don't know if you can see it from there, but look down right in the, just above the middle of the screen there. That's the Roman encampment. It's still there from 2,000 years ago because it's the desert, nothing changes. It doesn't rain and, and erode things. And so the Romans started building a siege ramp until 
But the Jews, what they did was they cut up boulders and they started. They were starting to roll them down on the on the Romans. And then the Romans got smart and they started taking slaves from Jerusalem, Jewish people, so they wouldn't kill their own people. So we saw some of the boulders still there. They never used them. Then when the Romans finally reached the top, to make a very long story short, they broke through the walls. All the Jews were dead. Not because the food had run out. In fact, they piled up mountains of food just to make a point. They would rather die by their own hands than be subjected to rape and pillage and being thrown to the lions as entertainment, which they knew would happen to them. And we arrived just in time before the last cable car. This happened to us wherever we went. We were just like, this is amazing. We got there before the last cable car went up, 20 seconds to spare when we got on. And uh, our guide told us the story of Masada up there outside the walls. When we were there, we were almost ready to leave, and we were standing by what we, we said it was a synagogue. So they, there was a synagogue with walls standing about this high, uh, the ruins of a synagogue. And all of a sudden, we heard this shofar blow. Which, by the way, if you've never heard a shofar, especially somewhere like Masada, it is very eerie. It just goes right through your spine. And all of a sudden, we saw all these Jewish men, again, different you know, some of, them, some of them are more orthodox than others. Some of them just looked like me with nothing to make them look like they were Jewish at all. Come running. Ten. Actually, it was nine. And they were waiting for one more person who was Jewish so they could have their prayer, right? A minion, as they call it. And so that was interesting to see that happening right next to us. Um, here we are going down the cable car. We, I d- did it in fast motion so you can just kind of see... It didn't, definitely didn't go that fast. <laughs> so, um, then, we, uh, then we, we got back in the bus and we slowly started making our ascent to Jerusalem. So, this is the part that, that is so emotional for me. It's hard to explain what was happening inside of me when we were ascending. Something, I felt like I was being pulled like a magnet up this ascent, this long ways up to Jerusalem. We started reading the 10 Ascent Psalms that are found in Scripture that, or the Vlad speaker, and I got to read one of the 10 Ascent Psalms. And when I read it, I thought about my ancestors singing these Psalms as they did the same trek up to Jerusalem, up to Mount Zion. My mother told me when I was younger uh, that her and my dad found out that we are ancestors of the Cohens, which are in the line of Aaron the priest, the priestly line. And so this just impacted me so deeply, and my heart just started overflowing, and my eyes started brimming with tears. I couldn't stop. And I've never had so much deep, deep from within me emotion in my life. The bus driver didn't help. He put on the song Jerusalem over the loudspeaker system as we were going through the tunnel. If you've never heard that song, it's an amazing song. Going through the tunnels, and by the time we came out and saw the beautiful, it was almost sunset, just beautiful, gleaming city of Jerusalem, I was a wreck. I was sobbing. And then our bus stopped at the crest of this hill overlooking the holy city. You can see that's the picture from what we could see. That's what time of day it was. And I was the first person off the bus, and the sun was just setting, and the city was golden with the, the Jerusalem stone. Everything in Jerusalem has to be made of Jerusalem stone. It's quarried from the mountains. Even all the new buildings by building code have to be built with the stone. Um, and I just fell to the ground, and I kissed the earth. My tears actually wet the dust. And I don't know who it was, but someone put a hand on my shoulder and just said, you're home, bro. You're home. And I could talk hours about Jerusalem, where we spent the rest of our trip. I won't, but I wanted to reveal just a few highlights. Uh, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem came out to greet us. That's her, uh, Fleur Hassan Nahum. Is, she's one of the rising stars in politics in Israel. I got a chance to speak to her. Um, I was very impressed with her skills. She is so skilled at, you know, Jerusalem is, is a very significant city for Christians, Jews, Muslims, and she manages, and one of her goals is to keep peace and unity between those three very large groups, and, and um, Jerusalem's logo you see everywhere is 
House of Prayer for All Nations. You see on banners, House of Prayer for All Nations. And so, um, she believes that bringing prosperity to those who are in poverty is going to help bring peace. And I think she's right. While I was there, Jerusalem felt like one of the safest cities I've ever been to. I know that sounds strange. But we walked on the beautiful streets at nighttime without any fear of violence. The city, in fact, the first night we were in Jerusalem, we went out for like a three-hour walk. I saw one police car near the end of the night. And the city has a vibrant nightlife. It's now double in size, over double in size in Tel Aviv. It's completely taken over. Um, it ha Tel Aviv has about 380,000 people, the size of London, Ontario. Jerusalem is now almost a million people. There are cranes everywhere. There is prosperity in the city. And um, in fact, it's prospering now more than it ever has in history. There are more than, there are almost 20,000 Jewish believers in Yeshua or Jesus now living in Israel. Most of them are in this area, Jerusalem. Up until the 70s, there were virtually none, 1970s. So 20,000, it doesn't seem like very many, but actually it is incredible to think about that. It's also called Startup City. You see that everywhere because of all the innovations that are coming out from Jerusalem literally to the ends of the earth. And that's one thing that they're so focused on. They said, we have been blessed to be a blessing. So we want to use the innovation that God's given us. God's mentioned a lot. God's given us this talent and ability to, to innovate. Let's innovate and help the rest of the world. Here's just one example. United Hatzalah. I have their wristband on my wrist here. United Hatzalah. There's a brochure about them over there. Uh, we went to visit uh, this place. Uh, Eli Beer is a, he is a national hero for both Muslims, Jews, and Christians, and the Druze people. Uh, Ali invented the AmbuCycle. Some of you have seen it. It's a small motorcycle. It's equipped with a $5,000 kit on the back that has um, defibrillator, oxygen, mini oxygen tanks, and first aid, and they can get anywhere. Through loud sirens, they can get anywhere in traffic, whizzing around, uh, and people pull over from them, but sometimes they have to just whiz right through traffic, and they are all run by volunteers. And the volunteers are Muslims, Christians, Jews, Druze. They are all doing this together to save lives. It's an amazing organization. They're all volunteers. Uh, they, give up, they give up a year of their life for training, paramedic training, and then they go back to their regular jobs, and there's this very high-tech app that people, everyone has on their phone. If they dial 1221, what will happen is that it will go right to the command center. We were in the command center, and so we saw it, and uh, you know what happens when you call in the command center? This high-tech app on your phone will find the person that's closest to you and dispatch them right away. There's usually someone within 40 seconds of where you're having your heart attack. Isn't it amazing? In Toronto, if you have a heart attack, the chance, my son tells me, honestly, you don't have a great chance of surviving unless you're out in public. But there, uh, they get there to accidents, to whatever. They go, the, the, um, the founder's daughter has delivered so many babies. And she's even gone into Bedouin tents in the desert and delivered babies. Um, and so it's really interesting that this is um, uh, technology. They actually even take over your phone so they can see where you are and see what's going on. So we dialed in to see how it worked. And uh, we could see our whole team on their big screens in there. And they tell you what to do until they can arrive. And so... Um, one time, I was out in Jerusalem in the evening before supper, and I saw two guys come running out of a restaurant, jump on their motorcycle, sirens going, and they rushed off. And I thought, wow, there, there's, there they are in action. And so, um, if you mention Ali Beer to a Jewish person in Toronto, they know who it is. And I did. My anesthesiologist, a few weeks ago, I said, hey, I got to meet Ali Beer. He said, you did? He said, you, all, you know he almost died? I said, I know the story. You know what happened? He went to Miami. He was setting up uh, United had a lot in Miami. He got COVID right at the beginning of COVID. He got so sick that they had to put him on a ventilator. And uh, our team leader, Bishop Robert Stearns, got Christians all over to start praying for him. They said, start, the doctor said, start planning his funeral to his family because he's not going to make it. He was on a ventilator for a month and not only did he survive, but he was there to greet us. And um, God spared his life and he knows it's a miracle. 
And it was kind of neat. I got a chance to share with him about uh, Joshua. He was really happy. He loves Toronto. And uh, was happy to hear that my son's a paramedic here. But there's, so there's medical advances. That's one thing. The technology of medical advances are being spread all over the world from Jerusalem. There's another thing about Jerusalem. It's the upper center of the world in other ways. It's also war could break out there very, very easy. That would affect the entire Middle East and the entire world. Um, and I'm just going to be careful how I say this, but the United Nations has politically taken a stand that erases all biblical history. UNESCO is the UN organization that oversees World Heritage Sites, and they have declared that no Jews have ever lived in the city of David, like back in the ancient days. The Bible is false. There is no Solomon's temple or King Herod's temple or, or King David that ever reigned there. And so this is an affront to us as Christians and to Jews, and this is where the trip got very interesting. Fifteen years ago, there was a sewage, a burst in a sewage pipe in the city of David. An 11-acre ridge just south of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The city of David, by the way, is one of the most archaeologically excavated sites in the world. It's Jerusalem Central. It's the place where kings of the Bible ruled and the prophets in the Bible preached. It was right there. And local plumbers were called to determine the source of the water leak there in Jerusalem. And as they excavated the terrain, they realized there was something unusual below street level. And as often as this happens, that prompts a call to the Jerusalem municipality who then call the Antiquities Authority and the experts examine the hole in this ground and they realize they had stumbled across a discovery of literally biblical proportions. They had uncovered the ancient steps leading to the Pool of Siloam. And so how many, you, you guys were in, you're in Pastor Isaac's class this morning, right? And Rebecca, you were in the Pastor Isaac class. That's what your story was, right? The Pool of Siloam, how Jesus healed a man at the Pool of Siloam who was, who was blind. And the Pool of Siloam was originally built by King Hezekiah 800 years before Christ. It was fed by the Gihon Spring through the Siloam Tunnel. The Babylonians destroyed the pool at the end of the 6th century BC, but then the Hasmoneans rebuilt it. And then King Herod enhanced it 200 years after that. And the pool was this public bath where Jewish pilgrims would purify themselves before ascending up to the temple. It's where Jesus cured a blind man. And then further excavation found something even more amazing. They said, you know, the Bible actually says Jesus went up from the pool of Siloam to the temple. There must be steps around here. And they found an almost perfectly preserved flagstone road ascending directly from the Pool of Siloam to the southern entrance of the Temple Mount. Its construction is attributed to a man named Pontius Pilate. Opposition to this project, as you can imagine, was intense. Because it's been taught that, as I said, that Jews do not have any historical connection to ancient Jerusalem. Even though it is mentioned 600 times in the Old Testament, In 2019, nearly half of the ancient street from the Pool of Siloam to the temple had been excavated. Let me show this slide. That's, I took that picture and walked up those steps. I just was like, I'm walking on the steps that Jesus walked up with his disciples. And to stand on the steps of the Pool of Siloam, it was a surreal moment. You see the next slide there. I took a picture of my feet, these same shoes. Because um, I was thinking, I'm standing on these steps of the Pool of Siloam. This is amazing. Jesus healed a man right here. And soon after, we stood in the ruins of King David's palace, which they, which they have some... Go back. Oh, yeah, go back for a second. King David's palace. Now, when you turn around from where I'm looking there, that's all covered up and it's all excavated. When you turn around from King David's palace, this is what you see. Next slide. Now can you see why David was seeing a woman bathing on the rooftop? <laughs> One of the uh, areas, uh, area parking lots, there was a parking lot over this t entire place. In fact, our tour guide said he had actually parked up there before. That's been excavated, and now you can find all these first century homes discovered underneath. And then we had the privilege of going behind locked doors to ancient tunnels under the Temple Mount. And I'm going to save some of the Indiana Jones 
type experience for another night, which I'll show you some videos. But I want to just give you a glimpse of what this is like. Now, this is amazing because, sorry, this is amazing because I am claustrophobic, and yet I do not feel a shred of fear going through this tunnel. Not a shred. One of the guys behind me got stuck. So just watch a little bit of this clip that I took as we were going down. I did not know how far down we were going to be going. We are going down underneath the Temple Mount, underneath the wall, the ancient walls of Jerusalem. <laughs> we weren't supposed to come in this place because it's, it's closed off to the public, but our tour guide was not only had knew the head of our biblical archaeology, but he's also former a bodyguard for Netanyahu, the prime minister. So all he did was dial a number and give it to the security guard, and he let us in. So I don't know what he said, but. You got that? Got it. Wow. Watch your head. Watch your head. Yo, we are on a mission right now. Not your ordinary tour. This is not your ordinary tour. <laughs> we are, we are, we are right now. We are right now. Oh, wow. Indiana Jones. Yo, what about our bigger brothers? Like, I ain't no ball for going behind us. This marks the area of the old city walls. Keep in mind the old city walls, which are now intact over Jerusalem, are only from the 16th century, 1538. So they're only about 500 years old. The walls we just saw now, the sister of Jeremiah, is nearly 3,000 years old. The palace of King David is 3,000 years old, and the big masonry stones below it are even older from the Jebusite period. So now we're basically entering the old city of Jerusalem, Underground to the secret passage, oh. you're now walking through two oh. 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 This is where it starts getting really, really squishy. Oh. <laughs> We're way underneath the ground now. <laughs> Secret tunnel, you're telling me. <laughs> we'll, we'll come out to a clearing soon. Yeah, this is one part, this is not a normal part of the tour. We actually got out, but one of the guys got stuck and he had to go back. And uh, they locked the gates, so we couldn't get out. So it was, it was a big ordeal. Anyway, it just keeps going and going and going. So you can stop. You can stop it. That's fine. Um, so uh, one of the things that we that we saw, got to see under there was um, so right underneath the royal palace, there was was a cistern, and it actually said hard hats only beyond this point. So he opened the door, just took us in. We weren't supposed to be in there, but we went down inside, and uh, we saw the spot a cistern, and he said, you know what's significant about the cistern? Look up, you see a shaft going up into the palace. He said, this is where Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 11 and 12, was lowered down with rags under his armpits down into the cistern. And apparently, we were one of the first to stand in that mud, uh, other than the archaeologists, archaeologists who have dug it out. And so we looked up in the shaft, and I did not want to wash my shoes afterwards. Because um, it was just like, this is like unbelievable. How long ago was that? Like it was, it's, it's like, what, 600 years before Christ. Uh, 650 before Christ. And so that was really neat to see that. Next morning, a very, very different experience. We went to something much more modern. That was Yad Vashem, International Holocaust Memorial Museum. 
and it's one of the most visceral experiences I've ever experienced, and I will not get into it tonight. Um, I did get a chance to share a story of my family, and the Director of International Relations, Dr. Haim Gertner, came out to greet me. He asked me questions about my family's story. It was a very emotional time there. I can't show pictures because we're not allowed taking pictures inside, but I could just talk the whole night about this one, this one experience. And later he talked about my family's experience with our entire group. And um, when you come out of the Holocaust Museum, you see a panoramic, panoramic view of Jerusalem. I had the privilege of meeting a Holocaust survivor who shared her story with us, one of the few Holocaust survivors left. Amazing, amazing story. Uh, sad story as well. And then here is the... I, I'm just going to fast forward to this part. This is actually... We went to Trinity... Um, we had a couple of interviews with Christian Media... This is the view from Trinity um, Broadcasting Network's patio. Do you know what that is? Anybody? Mount of Olives. So, so when you see a backdrop, if you're ever watching Christian TV and you see a backdrop there, it's real. It's not a fake backdrop. That's, that's the backdrop. Um, and so that was really interesting. Um, there we are sitting in front of the backdrop. But... What I was going to just say is this. Wouldn't it be amazing? So when Jesus returns, the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 to 4 and verse 9, that Jesus is going to return right there. Wouldn't it be? I was just thinking, sitting there, looking over that spot. There's TV cameras there all the time. Christian TV cameras. Satellite. I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if Christian satellite TV picks up that event of Jesus returning and broadcasts it to the entire world as Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says is going to happen, the whole world will see him return. How is that possible? Pretty cool. I'm not saying that that's going to happen but, uh, with that station, but I thought, that's amazing. It's, it's right there. It's going to happen. There's, there are high messianic expectations in Israel right now among the Jewish people. Very high messianic expectations. They really believe, many that we talked to believe that we are living in the last times. Uh, the most magnificent tour we had was deep inside this ancient city walls near the western wall. It hasn't officially opened up to the public yet, but we were given a sneak peek of this. Um, and then in what is dubbed the VIP section of the temple where special guests would go into before ascending to Herod's temple. It's an ancient underground building that's been considered the most magnificent public building from the second temple period that's ever been uncovered. Um, historians believe that the chambers that are there that we saw were led into reception rooms for dignitaries, members of the high priesthood, wealthy visitors. It's just, just been completed. And uh, there seems to be eating areas there as well, big chambers with decorative uh, places where water was coming down, water would come down. And um, we saw two small purification pools called mikvahs. Um, one of them still has a water source flowing in and out. They don't know where the water's coming from, but it's coming in and coming out. One of our tour guides said very likely Jesus would have ritually bathed right in that spot and gone up to the temple, as all Jews had to do. When you go up past the bath, you see the foundation stones of the western wall. The stones are massive. One of them weighs 250 tons. And as the guide pointed out, they said it's one of the largest building blocks in the world. The guide pointed out it's laser smooth. Modern engineers have been talked to, and they say they have no idea how they got them up there. So interesting. We touched them. They're still damp with the earth from being excavated. So amazing to touch them. Our guide said, as we got in there, he said, you are the first group, tour group, to see this. It was absolutely breathtaking. Later, we visited the Western Wall, which used to be dubbed the Wailing Wall, and if you want to find out why it's changed afterwards, I can tell you. Had the beautiful experience of, of praying at the wall. There's me in the background there. We all had to wear head coverings. If you had a baseball cap, that was fine, by the way. Um, and I was able to pray for one of our congregants here at Calvary, who I promised I was going to pray for. And right near the wall, we heard these little Hasidic Jews singing their scriptures. It was such a beautiful sound. It reminded me of the children singing when Jesus came to the temple. Then um, I'm going to go really quickly because I know some parents have to leave. Um, we had the vi privilege of meeting Palestinian Christian business leader, Mahar Shalal Hasbaz, uh, who in Bethlehem, uh, who is running for Bethlehem mayor later this spring. And uh, 
and then you'll see some of the things that have been created there of olive wood by the Palestinian Christians that are being sold in Bethlehem. By the way, uh, the tour guide who was with us, she said that it used to, Bethlehem used to be 80% Christian. It's now less than 5%. They've been driven out. Um, then on our last day of Israel, this is one of my favorites, we went to the Garden of Gethsemane where the olive trees are 2,000 years old. The same trees that were there you see some of the ones in the back with the really thick, thick stumps. Um, they were there when Jesus was there, a lot smaller then. And we had such a beautiful worship service there. Um, one of our pastors, he's from the YWAM base in Hawaii, was Toronto, former from, former from Toronto, preached an amazing message. And we sang, and it was just such amazing. I heard a rooster crow in the middle of our message. I thought of Peter, right? I thought, this is, this is so amazing. Where's that coming from? But anyway, and then we went to the garden tomb and Golgotha. I didn't realize they were so close to each other. There's the Golgotha is over here and the garden tomb is over here. Place of the skull where Jesus was crucified. That was one of the highlights of our trip. They're side by side. Here, I took this picture of Golgotha, and if you look really close, I put a circle around it. You can actually still see, it's called the place of the skull. You can kind of see a skull in the mountain there where, and our tour guide said Jesus was not crucified on the top of the hill, like we like to sing, he was actually crucified at the bottom by the road. That's where the Romans would have crucified Christ. And um, I know it kind of messes up our, some of our songs on a hill far away. But, uh, um, but you can still see that kind of likeness of the skull. Golgotha means place of the skull. Calvaria, which is the Latin term which we, which, from which we get the word Calvary, is, is the same thing. The garden tomb where Jesus, where the, where the garden tomb is, is a beautiful spot. And they know it was a garden where this tomb is because they don't know necessarily this has to be Jesus' tomb, but it fits all the descriptions of being outside the city walls and being near Golgotha. And um, the wine, they've uncovered a wine press. They said all of the gardens back in that time were actually where grapes were grown and wine was pressed. And so that's kind of interesting. Every visitor, this is what I found very significant, every visitor that visits the garden tomb has a tour guide who shares the gospel. And this tour guide's name was Caesar, and it turns out that he and I have a very good mutual friend, Reverend Steve Hawkins, who spent a week here at Calvary a few years ago. Some of you might remember Steve. And we ended our time at Golgotha with the Garden Tomb with a beautiful communion service. And I could just t keep talking, and I'm going to have to stop. But I just want to say, I want to end with two pictures. That's our communion tray there. I was going to bring a little cup. We got to keep our olive wood cups and I forgot to bring it. It's by my bed at home. Two pictures I found that illustrate what happened on this church. First one is just worship. It was the most amazing experience of worshiping the Lord there in the Holy Land in just a fresh way. And then the second is me smiling. And I just smiled everywhere I went because it was a dream come true for me. I felt like I needed to pinch myself. That I was in some kind of beautiful dream. I've, it, you know, I don't know if any of us read Narnia books, but the air in Israel smelt different. It smelt like just all this fragrant. Wherever we went, it smelt fragrant, fresh. The food seemed more delicious than anywhere else I'd eaten. Um, our big breakfast buffets, they said this was all produced here in Israel, except for the pineapples. Everything else was produced here in Israel. And I felt I was in some kind of strange time warp. A lot of people asked me when I returned, did it seem to go by really fast? And I said, no. I said, it seemed like time stood still. It seemed like every day seemed like a week. There was just so much to experience. And so when I returned 10 days after I left, it felt like I had been away for months. So strange. I'd like to end with a command from Psalms found in Psalm 122, verse 6 to 9. Pastor Gary Francis is here, one of our former pastors of Calvary. Come on up. And I see another one of our former pastors as well. Pastor Camille, you come up too. Pastor Camille, it's so good to see you. We prayed so much for you. And uh, would you just mind reading this passage of Scripture from, I wrote right here from Psalm 122, um, and then I'm going to get Pastor Gary to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. So it's, I can see it. it's right here. Can you see it there? All right. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Oh, I'm just going to give you a microphone here. Oh. Thank you. 
Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Pastor Gary. Would you rise with me as we pray? Lord, we thank you for the great city of Jerusalem. We thank you that it's today the presence of God sits on this very spot where our Savior, our Lord Jesus, walked and saved so many and brought the gospel to our world. Here's a city surrounded by enemies, surrounded, this land surrounded by so many difficulties, but yet it stands glorious today. And today we pray for the peace of families, for those who are in opposition, for those who are worshiping. We just pray for the peace and presence of God upon this wonderful place. So today we lift our hearts and our hands and our minds and our hearts to you. And say thank you for Jerusalem, that spot, that is so, that beautiful spot in the world, the holy city. May your presence and your power and your peace be upon the people there. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, friend, I want to invite you to join me on a journey. I want to invite you to join me on a journey of faith back to this land, the land of the Bible, the land of Abraham, of David, of Gideon, of Jesus, of the Apostle Paul. I want to invite you to link your heart, not with the history of what God did in this city, but what God is still doing here today. Would you consider becoming a partner with destiny, a partner with the prophetic purposes of God in this generation? We are living in the generation that has seen the Jewish people come back from the four corners of the earth. We are living in the generation that has seen Jerusalem reunited and brought together as one city again. We're living in the generation where Jew and Christian are coming together as one new man in Messiah. I want to invite you on a faith journey by becoming a partner of mine today partner with Eagle's Wings and make a difference for this land and for this people. I know it will change your life. If the Messiah comes, all the dead will rise. The dead will rise? This holy place. This place is a place of hope, Hatikva, a place of turning our heart toward God, lifting our prayer toward God. 
knowing that the God of the universe is a God who sees and a God who hears. I will call upon the name of the Lord, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit draws near and touches every area of your heart, and that the God of hope reveals his beautiful answers and plans.